Certain game developers are famous for big games, but not everybody's track record is perfect. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, the 10 worst games by big game developers. Starting off at number 10, it's Ninja Blade coming to us via From Software. These days, the name From Software, the developers of the Dark Souls series, Bloodborne and Sekiro, is synonymous with quality. But most reviewers back then gave their games pretty average reviews. From's back catalog is sort of getting a critical reevaluation right now, and it seems like most people like these games now more than they did back then. Maybe a lot of people look back uh, on Ninja Blade fondly these days, I don't know. But but I played it back in 2009 and it is, it's not great. In every way, it looks and feels like the budget game that it is and tries to punch above its weight with some pretty wild QTE filled cutscenes. And there's only so much they can do to cover up the cost cutting. The environments are pretty much all around ugly as hell and the combat is really basic and it's got so many QTEs. Some of the bosses are appropriately ridiculous, but the whole thing has this B movie energy that is honestly kind of fun and it almost works in this way where it's a so bad it's good kind of experience, but it's pretty rough. Probably the most shocking thing about it is that it came out just one month before Demon Souls came out in Japan. Ninja Blade came out in January and Demon Souls came out in February. So in the span of two months, From Software released one of their worst games followed by an absolute classic. Ninja Blade's hardly the worst game on this list, but in comparison to From's best games, it barely registers. And number 9 is Fuse from Insomniac Games. These days, Insomniac is riding pretty high. Ratchet and Clank rift apart and the recent Spider-Man games have gotten rave reviews and right now it seems like they're a developer that can do no wrong. But that was not always the case. Back in the 7th generation of consoles, Insomniac was just as prolific as they are today. They pumped out multiple Ratchet and Clank sequels, the entire Resistance trilogy for the PS3, but for whatever reason it seemed like Insomniac wanted to branch out a bit and try for this multi-platform release called Overstrike, which, to be fair, actually looked pretty cool. It had a kind of Saturday morning cartoon energy, basically looked like Overwatch before Overwatch was a thing. It was pretty promising, but the actual final result was completely forgettable, because uh, we didn't get Overstrike. Instead, we got Fuse, a totally generic third-person shooter that wasn't terrible, but it was well below the studio's usual quality. The whole thing was beyond forgettable. The presentation was generic, the story was forgettable, and while the shooting and gameplay was serviceable, there really wasn't a lot to latch on to. Case in point, anyone out there who was gaming in that era, do you remember Fuse? Before we were doing this video, I, I never think of this game. I don't think there's anything online that says exactly what went down with this game, but it's published by EA, so it's easy to blame them for taking a game idea that looked pretty fresh and ruining it. I mean, that is kind of what EA does, but at the end of the day, the game was actually made by Insomniac, so they're probably more responsible for how bad the game actually is, at least in this case. And number 8 is Paragon from Epic Games. Everyone and their mother knows Epic Games, the makers of Fortnite, Battle Royale, but they've made a lot of other games in the past, including some truly great games like Unreal and Unreal Tournament. And, as you might have guessed, the Unreal Engine, which is used by so many developers. They've been around in some form all the way back to 1991, and they made games for MS-DOS. And while the games they've made haven't always been winners, they're usually decent. That is until Paragon. Paragon, which was revealed back in 2015 when Epic was in kind of a slump before they struck gold with Fortnite. Paragon was basically another game-chasing MOBA success. It wanted to be the next League of Legends. Instead, it ended up being the next, I don't, I don't know, Infinite Crisis? Yeah. Paragon, at least for most players' accounts, wasn't like incredibly bad or anything. It was just mishandled by Epic. In an attempt to make a, a game new player friendly, they took out pretty much everything that made the game unique. Like, they'd constantly release these massive reworks that completely changed how the game functioned, which left players frustrated and confused. It's the sort of thing that a lot of dying games struggle with, where they try to change things to make people happy, but just ends up scaring people away. Of course, the real nail in the coffin for Paragon was the success of Fortnite. They just didn't need Paragon anymore, so off with its head, so to speak. It wasn't the worst game ever or anything, but it was a pretty big failure for one of the biggest developers in the world right now.
At number seven is The Devil's Third from Nintendo, a game released for the Wii U. It's a bizarre FPS slash third person action game with some pretty heavy hitters behind it. You had Nintendo publishing it. It was directed by Tomonobu Itagaki, the guy behind Dead or Alive and Ninja Gaiden Black. Even if a game isn't directly made by Nintendo, their name attached to it, it's usually a sign of quality, but from all accounts, Devil's Third was basically DOA and not like Dead or Alive, the game DOA here means dead on arrival. Not even Nintendo could save this turkey, basically. The game's just plain rough. It's ugly with blurry textures and a really stuttery, awful frame rate. The actual way you play the game, switching from first person to shoot at enemies, third person to fight close range is kind of interesting, but the controls are really stiff and never feels good. Plus, the plot is nonsense, and the main dude you play as is just completely ridiculous looking. It's just an all-around bad game and a black mark on Nintendo's usually stellar record. Can't win them all though, right? And number six is Sonic Chronicles from BioWare. Uh, BioWare's reputation isn't quite what it used to be, but in general, they're known for making, if not the best games, then at least playable ones. So released back in 2008, just a year after the first Mass Effect, Sonic Chronicles was a game that had potential. I mean, Mario had three different RPG series under his belt. Why not Sonic? The fact the game was being developed by BioWare, of all people, was a pretty big shock at the time. And even though it was only getting a handheld release, people couldn't help but be excited for it. Remember back Back in 2008, Bioware was only putting out hits. Uh, Mass Effect, Jade Empire, Knights of the Old Republic, all amazing games. So people had no reason to think this would be bad. And the reviews at the time were mostly positive, but these days the game is generally thought of pretty negatively and with good reason in our opinion. The two main problems with the game is that it's really boring and the music is so bad. Like some of the music in this game is ear splittingly bad. The combat also, it's slow with these combat constant, tedious QTE sequences you have to complete to pull up certain moves. And the presentation in general feels like cheap and ugly, I guess is the best way to put it. Bioware's inexperience with this type of a game is pretty obvious and it's pretty frustrating overall. For some people, the game was Bioware's first big disappointment. Like They've made a lot of great stuff in the past, but Sonic Chronicles is not one of those things. At number five is Artifact from Valve. Valve doesn't make a lot of games these days, but when they do, they're usually great. So it's a shame about Artifact because a lot like Paragon, the game has its fans, but the mishandling by Valve eventually led to the game's premature death. Artifact was an online card game developed by Richard Garfield, the creator of the Magic the Gathering card game, and was based off Valve's popular Dota 2. By all accounts, it should have been a hit, but a few key mistakes ended up killing any momentum that the game might have had. For one thing, the monetization model was not good from the jump. Expecting players to pay $30 to buy the game, then asking them to buy card packs on top of that is, it's a lot. And that's not even getting into the drafting game modes you also had to play to participate at all. It's another game where the critical response didn't match the player response at all. Um, according to Wikipedia, at least, the game saw a 95% decline in players in just two months after it came out. So obviously people were not happy with it. Eventually Valve tried to reboot it with Artifact 2.0, but the game was already doomed at that point. It wasn't just a sinking ship, it was already at the bottom of the ocean. While the game itself isn't necessarily terrible, it was a massive public failure for Valve, and they rarely fail at anything. And number four is Umbrella Core by Capcom. No, we're not going to talk about Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City. Yes, it is also a bad game, but it is not as bad as this one. Developed internally by Capcom, Umbrella Core is a multiplayer shooter set in the Resident Evil universe that was released in 2016. And it was probably the worst possible time to put out a multiplayer shooter with a Resident Evil name on it. Resident Evil 7 was just a year out, and while Revelations 2 came out in 2015 and was well received, most people considered it a secondary game in the series rather than a big new entry, so at the time I think a lot of people were worried about the future of the franchise. Putting out a game that's basically Resident Evil in name only wasn't gonna make fans happy. And as it turns out, it didn't. Umbrella Core plays out like a typical team-based FPS with a few new wrinkles like zombies that attack both teams that don't really make it stand out a lot. In general, it's just an unsatisfying FPS that doesn't feel too good to control and didn't manage to attract a lot of new players. The game was basically dead on arrival and it's pretty much forgotten. Like Capcom and Resident Evil has a fair share of stinkers, but Umbrella Core just has nothing going for it. 
And number three is The Quiet Man by Square Enix. Yes, seriously, The Quiet Man, one of the most bizarre games in the past few years, was published by Square Enix. Even more bizarre is that its developer, Human Head Studios, are the guys who made the original Prey. Like, what more do we really need to say about this game? The Quiet Man was basically a quasi-interactive movie where you watch a bunch of FMVs and fight enemies with one of the most basic combat systems we've ever seen. It, this game makes Final Fight look mechanically complex. But the weirdest thing about it is his central concept, which is that you play as a deaf guy. That's not the weird part. The weird part is that you, as the player, hear pretty much nothing. It's an interesting idea, but the game totally botches it. It doesn't even make any sense in the world of the game. Like, why are there no sound, even in these long sequences where the man guy isn't even there? The whole thing's just dumb, with these ridiculous melodramatic twists and silly supernatural stuff that feels like it belongs in a different game. The combat sucks, the story's insane, but the whole thing's surprisingly good looking on the rare occasions where there's in-game cutscenes instead of FMVs. It's just one of the most all around strange games out there and the fact it was published by Square Enix makes it weirder. And number two is Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis by Sonic Team. So while Sega publishes a lot of games these days, Sonic Team remains one of the few internal developers Sega has got, and they've been around for a long time at this point. You might think we'd put something like Sonic 2006 or Sonic R, or that game where Shadow the Hedgehog shoots guns, but they've actually managed to make something that's worse than any of that stuff. We're talking about Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis, a port of the original Sonic game for Game Boy Advance. I know. I know, how bad could a Sonic port be? Well, if Metacritic is anything to go by, then really, really bad. You'd think it'd be really easy to port a really old game to a new platform like the GBA about 15 years after the original game's release, but uh, I, apparently not. Uh, for some reason, the game's frame rate is abysmal. The port came out in 2006, which like I said, is about 15 years after the original game's release, and the frame rate is so much worse on the GBA version of this game. It shouldn't be. Genesis was a 16-bit system. Game Boy Advance was a 32-bit. It had a CPU speed more than twice what the Genesis had. So it's not like they were working with an inferior thing. And yet, way worse frame rate. Jump physics all screwed up. Sections of the game that used to be easy on the Genesis are difficult just because the game is bad. And even something as simple as the way Sonic speeds up and slows down is messed up. Also, the soundtrack was cut down a lot. A lot of the sound effects are just completely gone. It's a huge mess. People have often accused Sonic Team of being a half-assed developer, and it's hard to argue with that when they willingly put out a port like this. I mean, seriously, it's a game that you made 15 years prior. You just had to port it, and they screwed it up that bad. And finally, at number one, it's Way of the Warrior by Naughty Dog. Every studio has to start somewhere. These days, Naughty Dog is known for blockbuster games like Uncharted and The Last of Us, but they didn't start out huge. Originally, there were just a few dudes in an apartment trying to make a few bucks creating a Mortal Kombat ripoff. And that's Way of the Warrior, one of many, many copycats from the early 90s that tried to piggyback off of Mortal Kombat's success. There's basically nothing notable about the game itself. It's just one of dozens of crappy FMV fighting games from back in the day. The only surprising thing about it is that Naughty Dog made it. Not just that, but it was the game that got them in with Universal Interactive, which in turn got them a three game deal that eventually became Crash Bandicoot. So basically without Way of the Warrior, Naughty Dog might not even exist today. It's pretty obvious that Naughty Dog didn't really get fighting games with Way of the Warrior. The gameplay is stiff, it's really unbalanced, it's shallow as hell, it's just an all around bad fighting game. The stories you can find online about making Making it are more interesting than the game itself, so check out some of that if you're curious. There's just something funny about the fact that you can draw Naughty Dog's current success back to something as dumb and forgettable as Way of the Warrior. Any longtime developer is going to have some crap in their back catalog, but few are as ridiculous and bad as this game. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications and as always we thank you very much for watching this video i'm falcon you can follow me on twitter at falcon the hero we'll see you next time right here on game ranks